Our first segment of the day is regarding 55 schools in Chicago have found that there is zero students proficient in math and reading. As always, support the show by hitting that like and subscribe button. Leaving us a short, sweet comment down below. Your help and support would be greatly appreciated. Now, I did a similar story on this just about a week and a half, two weeks ago, where it came out that 23 schools were sampled in Maryland and found that those 23 schools in Baltimore also had zero students proficient in math and reading. And then they basically expanded it and found that only 2% were roughly proficient in math and reading all across the board. Those numbers are kind of skewed in direction left or right. But the main purpose is now we have 55 other schools in Chicago, another Democrat-ran area where students are not proficient in math and reading. Here's that segment on Fox News. Let's go ahead and roll it. Check this out, a stunning report from the Illinois Board of Education showing across 55 Chicago schools, zero students, zero, are proficient in math or reading. But despite the numbers, the board is still rating some of these schools as commendable. Willie Preston is an Illinois state senator and father of six in Chicago. Willie, thank you for getting up early. This is shocking. This should alarm everyone in the country who has a kid in school. Yes, thanks for having me. I, I, I totally agree. I believe this is something that is a byproduct of some of our policies that we're taking during COVID. In fact, uh, I think some of it is a byproduct, but what's going to happen here is that we're going to put all the blame on COVID and kind of throw the real issues under the rug of what's actually taking place in the education system. And I love how the anchor starts off with saying, well, this is pretty much a shock that we should all be surprised by this. No, we shouldn't. This has been going on for at least a decade. Even longer than that, we've had math proficiency and reading scores on a decline. So I think he's coming out of a world of ignorance here and kind of turning a blind eye, which I think a lot of Americans are doing to this situation. And I'm kind of even taking a small sample here with my channel of whenever I talk about the education system as an educator myself, it is easily my least watched videos other than immigration, which are supposed to be the top two issues for Americans here. So when you have 55 schools in Chicago, a Democrat ran area of zero students proficient in math and English or reading rather, I'm sitting back going, well, that doesn't really surprise me. Yeah, it's a harsh number, but as somebody that's worked in the education system for about five years now, which isn't long whatsoever, to me, it's not a surprise. But what you're going to see here is he's going to talk about all the funding that's going into it, you know, all the money that teachers are getting, which we're not, you know, and all these things. And he's going to pin it on the teachers where this guy's saying, hey, there's a lot of variables here that really go involved into a student's learning or a student's education that we might want to highlight. But I also don't like the fact that he's highlighting COVID here as one of the main causes as to why this year students all of a sudden aren't proficient in math and reading when they weren't proficient in math and reading even to begin with. Uh, my congressman, Congressman Jonathan Jackson, coined the phrase COVID learning loss. I wish that I could take credit for that, but I can't. And I'll tell you, this is a very serious issue and one that as a father and as a lawmaker, I'm going to be addressing feverishly. Uh, feverishly. As you should, let us show our viewers this fiscal year, $9.4 billion has been allocated to Chicago's public school budget by the state. Add to that on top, another $1.8 billion being given to the Chicago schools by the federal government. Willie, that's more than $10 billion, and you've got zero proficient kids in 55 Chicago schools. Why did that happen? Well, what I can tell you is, um, one, government isn't the answer for all things. I think that we have to re-engage parents, have parents actively taking a role inside the schools when they can be. Um, but in addition, we need to make certain that we bring on, we spend our money in the right way as it pertains to our children's education. For but, instance, but, but Willie, Willie let, me, let me stop you there for a second, though, because you said parents getting involved. Sure. Parents have been crying, pleading for better schools, for better classrooms. This clearly, this is irrefutable evidence that these teachers, protected by teachers' unions, are not doing their job in teaching these kids when you literally. That is pure ignorance, and this is where I have a problem with it. I do agree that there's money going to the teachers' union. I do agree with certain aspects of what he is saying, 100%. I actually, when I was an accountant, I used to listen to John and Ken on AM640, which is a conservative or Republican or red uh, a radio show, and when I would find out how much teachers are getting paid because they're government employees, it's, it's all public, I used to be pissed because I knew back then, so you're going 15 years ago, of, wow, teachers aren't teaching, kids are not proficient in math and reading, why are we paying them so much money? And now as an educator, I'm sitting there going, well, 
there's students that aren't proficient in math and reading and i'm an educator going i'm doing everything i possibly can i'm using every strategy i'm using every theory i'm using everything that i was taught in my education when my credential program to help and support these children thank god a lot of mine do extremely well but to sit there and say well they aren't they aren't doing anything in the classroom or they aren't teaching to me you guys that is such bs I'm, I'm sure there are teachers that are like that. I've had teachers like that in the past, but the vast majority, I mean, the vast majority are teaching in the classroom. If you think somebody's sitting there not doing anything, you are sorely mistaken. There's times where you might see a teacher sitting down at their desk. They're writing emails while the kids are working. If kids have questions, they raise their hand. The teacher can assist them. The teacher's checking for knowledge. There's so much that goes on in there that it's mind blowing that he would sit there and go, well, you know, the teachers are receiving all this money. There's $10 billion thrown at the education system and there is a lot of money being thrown at it, but you can do everything you can as an educator to help an individual. If they don't want to be helped, if they don't want to take the time to learn mathematics, which takes a lot of mathematical practice outside of the classroom. There's a reason why we got 30 to like 60 problems a night when we were kids. They're not doing that anymore. Some school districts are doing with homework altogether. They don't have math homework. There's districts here in California that are giving them five problems a week of mathematics no i'm not kidding you can't be good at math you can't score well you can't be proficient in mathematics when you're either doing zero practice or you're having five problems a week you are not going to be good at it it's the same thing as a skill it's a set that's why we call it mathematical skills mathematical practice because you actually have to practice it to be good at it and understand it just like any sport and i use this analogy all the time if you're going to sit there and practice a sport all the time, odds are you're going to be good at it. If you don't practice that sport all the time, you're going to suck at it. And you can't blame the coach. You can't blame the trainer. You should be blaming yourself for not putting the effort to understand it. With technology nowadays, people think I'm just ranting here, but that it's a fact. You might not like to hear it, but it is true. You can learn anything you want to learn. You can learn it at home from a cell phone. You can you can get it on the outside. You as a parent can learn it yourself and teach your, your son or daughter, which I know isn't the best option to do, but it's still there for you. So all these things are there. I just don't like the fact that he's blaming all the teachers. There are teachers to blame. Trust me, I've even seen them myself. But to sit there and say that knucklehead thing, 100% disagree with. When you sample schools in Maryland and Chicago, and you're going to blame it all on the teachers, statistically, that is extremely asinine. There's something bigger going on. You can't just put it all on COVID. Some of it you can. Some of it you can. But like I said, what was going on before COVID then? Why were students not proficient in math and English or reading before COVID? That's a thing. That's a, again, this is going to get thrown under the rug because we're going to blame it on COVID and then we're going to do something and yada, yada, yada. We have zero students proficient in math and reading in 55 schools. If the numbers were low and substandard, maybe you can make the argument that it's two-way street, but something's not happening in that classroom. Mind street. you, we just went last year through in some areas of the country, uh, the, these parents that were speaking out forcefully at uh, at the you know town halls were being labeled uh, domestic terrorists. True. Well, I don't know. That I'm not saying true that they're terrorists. I, I actually agree with them here. I think schools should have been open. I taught in the classroom all through COVID, all through COVID. I think we were remote learning for about two weeks. Other than that, I was in front of students teaching them live in the classroom. There was shortened classes, so I had to do things, vir do th uh, things virtually, use videos and things like that. But I agree. COVID did hurt. We should have had those kids back in the classroom. There were teachers unions that were speaking on behalf of those that didn't want to be spoken on behalf of that just wanted to go back to work. But yet, you know, when you're part of a union, it's those that are in leadership that are advancing things. You don't really have a say in all of that. Yeah, you could be un you could be not unionized, which is what I was before, not under the union. What are, where are you going to go? You're going to work where there is no work. So you can't just throw everybody in a lump sum here. There's a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers that weren't pushing um, the stuff that this guy's talking about. There's a lot of teachers just want to go back in the classroom and teach. You can, it's, it's fair to lay this all at the feet of teachers. I think there are other factors, such as there are a lot of children that are facing um, homelessness, that are not attending classes regularly. There are a number of factors in addition to uh, into that. What we have to find, we, a lot of these schools, a lot of these children are coming from poverty-stricken communities. And I believe that as a community, we just can't focus on the dollars being put in the classrooms. We have to re-engage a working class, uh, rebuilding working class communities. We have to have parents that are actually able to get their children to school every day on time inside of a classroom um, fed with the lunch um, so the kids are ready to, to learn every day. Well, so yeah. when you have a... I hear you. I hear you. But you're the father of six. Walk in these shoes for a sure. moment. If in one of your oh, children's walking. classes, not a single student was proficient in math and reading, would you not hold those teachers accountable? I think you could hold teachers accountable, but on what evidence? That, that's always been my question, right? There's a lot of 
talk. Ben Shapiro's talked about this. Steven Crowder, Candace Owens, a lot of conservatives talked about this of, well, how do you sit there and rate a teacher? How do you basically objectively look at a teacher and say whether they're good or bad? Is it based on the student's performance? Because again, how, how do you do that? You could do literally, I could do everything in my power to teach the kids. I could have videos. I can have guided notes. I can have notes themselves. I can have other sources they can go to learn from other instructors online. I could teach them live. I could do literally everything, which I've already done. And you could still have students that are failing. And you have every student failing in the classroom in an underprivileged school. Well, welcome to underprivileged school. Sadly, I, I mean, that's, that's not every student, but you're talking about proficiency scores. Students could score well on a test currently that they're studying for because it's short-term memory. But when they have to grasp long-term memory on an objective test they've never seen before, they're not going to do well. And what you've seen in the education system is students are just basically seeing the test and they're allowed to retake it later if they don't score well on it. So none of it's actually conceptual. None of it's actually understanding. None of it is really taking factual knowledge, converting it to conceptual knowledge, converting it to procedural fluency and actually showing your work and be able to interpret and understand it. It's just basically, oh, I just need to do well on this test and I'll forget it later. So when you talk about proficiency that you're giving somebody at a later date and a later time, they're not proficient in it at all. It doesn't mean they don't know any math. It doesn't mean they're not doing well in the classroom necessarily. It just means that they are actually not retaining the knowledge and fully comprehending and understanding it to score well on a test. So there's two basically modes and metrics of what we're looking at here. But I, I just, I'm really disagreeing with this Fox News anchor here of, well, if all the kids aren't doing well, shouldn't we be raising eyebrows? Yes, but the conversation, like this guy's been saying, it is a two-way street here. You gotta look at the parents, you gotta look at the administration, you gotta look at the school, the classroom, the resources, the teachers, but also really the students because you're living in a milieu in a society where there's no reason as to why you can't learn something. Uh, that's one thing that always floors me. What we always just roll over the turtle shells. We go, oh, well, me, I'm not, I'm not learning in the classroom. This is why I tell my students. I have a really great relationship with them. So they really tell me, oh, this person's not teaching me. This person's not doing this. This person's not doing that about other, you know, staff or whatever. And this happened, this has happened literally every year. And I just tell them, I said, why do you have that mentality? Why are you waiting for somebody to just teach you everything, which they should be. I 100% agree with that. But why are you inculcating that own value in yourself of, well, I'm just going to fail because they're not teaching me. Why can't you go online and just teach yourself? Mind you, I'm mostly seniors, so I'm explaining to them, when you go to college, your professors don't care about you. You're just another number. You're just a price tag. You're just a dollar sign to them. Yeah, you're gonna have good professors, but you're gonna have professors that suck. What do you have to do? Teach yourself. I taught myself almost every single class in college. I went down to the library for like example statistics. I sat there for three hours, looked at the tech textbook. I watched videos and I taught myself statistics so that I can actually know it. I got an A in the class, the highest grade in the class. Everybody else was getting D's and C's because they're like, oh, this guy's not teaching me. I can't understand his accent and all these other things. Screw that guy. Go teach yourself something. Stop sitting there and just waiting on everybody to do something. If you got a son or daughter that's not doing well in the education system, and maybe their teacher's not the best, that is a possibility. I'm sure that they are actually really good in teaching them in the classroom. But when that transitions to the home life, it's a little bit different. They're on TikTok. They're on Snapchat. The cognitive function of them is a little bit lower. Yes, due to COVID, but also missing gaps of knowledge. There's a lot more variables that are going on than this than just saying, well, it's a bad teacher. They're not doing their job really in two states. I mean, I know they're Democrat ran states, but you're telling me that all the teachers aren't doing their job. Really? I find that very hard to believe as somebody that's watched teachers and observed other teachers find it very hard to believe. No, no, no question about it. But again, if we, if we, we, we miss, um, we miss something. If we only focus on what happens once the kids get in the classroom or if they actually get in the classroom, I think there's more that we can glean from this is what I'm getting at. We have to figure out why is it just the teachers? Yeah. I think if it's just the teachers, then we have an issue, but if, but I don't think that's the case here. This I'm, is stemming from a larger issue in Chicago overall. Well, that's for sure. I only got 10 seconds. Question is, can it be turned around? Absolutely. Yeah. Hold the kids back. We don't hold anybody back anymore. When we grew up, guys, we were held back. There was times when you have a guy that's like two or three years older than you. You're like, what are you still doing in my classroom? And it was embarrassing for him to be hanging out with people that are three years younger than him. And he's not progressing and everybody else is progressing. I mean, the, his friends have all graduated, but he's still hanging around. Yeah, hold them back. There's no consequences. Nobody gets held back anymore. Literally nobody. So if they're not proficient in math and reading, why are they graduating? Why are they advancing to the next grade level? Somebody here in the live chat, I'm going to look right now. Somebody in the live chat, explain to me logically why somebody's advancing to the next level in grade if they're not proficient at their grade level. I'll wait. I don't know. 
I'm the edu I'm an educator. I want to help them advance. But if they're not advancing, if they don't have the skills that are necessary to advance forward, why are we advancing them forward? If somebody's failing algebra one and they just take credit recovery where they just sit there and fill in a bunch of boxes and get credit for it and then advance to algebra two when they don't even know algebra one. So they fail algebra two because they're not proficient in algebra one. Yet we're advancing them through that. So they still fail algebra two. And it's my fault because they failed both algebra one and algebra two. They didn't have the skills needed to go into algebra two, but somehow it's my fault. And somehow I have to find the, the time to sit there and actually inculcate all these missing gaps of knowledge in them that come from elementary school all the way up through algebra one now algebra two. And somehow that's going to be put on me and my fault. You see how this is like a bigger issue and I'm not venting or, or, or upset about it. I'm just waiting for an answer of like, why are we pushing kids through the system if they don't know the content? It's very simple. I know it sucks for that, that child that's already struggling at home or my, maybe they have abusive parents. Maybe they're in a, a, a rough social environment. I, I'm understanding of that. But just to sit there and be like, well, you know, uh, we'll create more stuff for them to help them advance and progress. We'll put teacher's assistance in the classroom. It, it's just, it's what we have been doing. The one thing we haven't been doing since Bush was in office with the Ch No Child Left Behind Act is actually holding people back and holding them to a standard. And they don't have that standard. Great. You can, you can just not graduate. See, you go to adult school if you want to figure it out. You'll figure it out later. Society will push you. You'll have to adapt to figure it out. But just pushing people through the system is crazy. And we've talked about how in Los Angeles many years ago, you had an uh, underprivileged school where the students couldn't actually pass the high school exit exam to graduate high school. So rather than going, well, they don't graduate high school, what they do, they got rid of the exit exam. No, I'm not kidding. So we're just lowering the standards rather than raising them, putting people and students to a higher bar here of excellence so that they actually push forward and know that we're not messing around. Students just show up and they're, they're just, they know you show up and tie your shoes and you sit in class, you'll basically pass. It, it can be turned around if we, again, reappropriate dollars to the classroom the right way, make certain that every teacher has. Uh, a teacher's A, for instance. Mm -hmm. We can reappropriate it if we start to ensure that we have children and, and yep. this, that have parents that are able to actually have a, a stable home and yep. not just have kids running around from place to place and not knowing where their next meal is coming from. I mean, there's not much you could do with that as somebody that's a government official of making sure that somebody has you know a solid home that they're living in. Sure, you could take some sort of part into that, but where you could start other than making standards higher and harder for students and holding them back is basically making classroom sizes smaller. When you have 34 students, put it this way, math problems a lot of times take about eh, 30 seconds to a minute to explain depending on the level of math. So if I just took the time in one class to try and support every single student individual with 34 students, you're talking about anywhere from what, 22 minutes to 32 minutes plus of time in support of helping each student individually. Well, there goes your class time. You can't. So if you want to actually help and provide and support these students, you would cut the class sizes down to 12 to 15 students individually, which is what it's supposed to be, by the way. Classrooms are only supposed to be 10 to 15 students max. They've tripled the size or double the size depending on the school district. So again, there's a lot of problems with it, but I'm gonna keep bringing awareness to all of this. Maybe some point somebody will listen, but let me know your guys' opinion on this. Again, I wasn't always an educator. I'm coming predominantly from a career of public accounting into a career of education. So it's about my third or fourth year of teaching. So I'm still very new to it. I've grasped a lot of knowledge. I've understood a lot of things and seen a lot of things from both, again, really good schools and also really bad schools. And I'm just presenting you what I've seen. And what I've seen is just a lack of care in somebody's own education predominantly. If you have a teacher that's willing to tell you the truth, a lot of kids just don't care. And they'll probably just tell it to yourselves if you ask them. They don't really care. They'll blame it on a teacher and somebody else. But in reality, we know what's going on. I hope you enjoyed that clip from the Bald Brad Show. If you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all our future content.